I want you to hit me as hard as you can. Go, go! Well, another summer movie season is closing up shop, and this year we're going out on a bang as Jason Statham returns to the big screen to whoop some ass and blow things up in Mechanic Resurrection. Granted, I don't know why they're making a sequel to the Jason Statham movie that I don't think Jason Statham's mother even saw, but at least they made the effort to bring Jason Statham back. Because as action heroes go, the man's pretty goddamn irreplaceable. I mean, the last time they tried making a sequel to one of his movies without him, we got last year's cinematic disaster, The Transporter Refueled. Yes, the Transporter franchise from producer and writer Luke Besson was the diving board that helped launch Statham as one of the biggest action heroes of our time. But when they decided to make a fourth installment, they wanted Statham to sign a three-picture deal without showing him the scripts first. So Statham instead went on to flex his comedic skills in Paul Feig's acclaimed action spoof, Spy. While the Transporter franchise decided to reboot with another raspy voice British dude in the driver's seat. Former Game of Thrones star, Ed Screen. And the results ended up being the worst received Transporter movie yet, both in critical reception and American box office. But seeing as I appreciate a good dumb action movie as much as the next guy, let's give another chance to this uh, sequel, uh, prequel, reboot, reimagining, re-envisioning? Why this movie is all this and more! It's a sequel, prequel, reboot, imagine visioning a movie. Hopefully, like Bruce Campbell, I'll think this flick is groovy. But yes, the driver's seat of Transporter Porter Frank Martin is filled this time by Ed Screen? Scrying? Uh, Skrillex? Uh, look, it's Ajax from Deadpool. What's my name? Yes, he may say his name is Frank, but we all really know it's Francis. Oh, he's such a romantic. So for those unfamiliar with the last three movies, Frank is a former special ops guy, now working as a hired driver in France, who transports mysterious packages for rich, evil clients, with no questions asked, and is being paid a visit by his dad, played by Ray Stevenson, who leads an equally mysterious and dangerous lifestyle as a super spy. You know, in my day, when you wanted to make a cup of coffee, you just had to boil the water and strain the grinds. I said you, sir. Transporter and Son, coming this fall on CBS. But their bonding session is interrupted when Frank accepts a job offer from a woman named Anna, who wants him to pick her up along with a couple of other packages from the Mediterranean Bank. However, Frank finds out that these two packages happen to be women who have just helped Anna in robbing the bank, because these three women happen to be enslaved prostitutes who have decided to break free of their Russian mobster pimps and steal money from them before they make their getaway. Frank wants to renege on the deal until Anna reveals they're holding his dad hostage, which forces him to help these girls out in stealing money from these Russian gangsters and defend them from the violent thugs hot on their trail. So it's your basic transporter movie setup, except the transporter now has a sizable amount of hair on his head this time. They should have called it the transporter rehaired. Maybe it would have done better. Then again, it probably wouldn't have, because try as he might, Ed Screen is simply no Jason Statham. He's got the raspy Cockney accent, he's got the fighting skills, but he just can't reach that same level of smart-ass wit and clever one-liners that Statham has. I also need your stamp right here. Okay, sure. Done. Huh? <laughs> <clears throat> Still, he's not that bad. I don't know, maybe it's because I've seen how good Ed Screen can be in Deadpool, but I think he does the job just fine. Besides, the rest of the movie is just the kind of rapid-fire action movie ridiculousness we all love to see in a Transporter movie. We've got the Transporter cracking open fire hydrants with the trunk of his car. He gets out of his car and manages to beat up some thugs while the car is still in gear. He manages to drive his car into a jet bridge and through an airport like the goddamn Blues Brothers. Baby clothes. This place has got everything. And to top it all off, he not only drives a jet ski through the sand, but also manages to defy all laws of gravity and jump through a car window. <laughs> yes, he would need the lower body strength of a gorilla to actually pull this off, but who fucking cares? That shit was awesome! 
But aside from its magnificently silly action, the film also has some fun chemistry going between Frank and his father. For one thing, Frank's dad is arguably more suave and badass than his son is in this movie. And their relationship is taken straight from Indiana Jones and his dad in The Last Crusade, right down to the father calling his son Junior. Late again, Junior. And who's gonna come to save you, Junior? Is it a shameless ripoff? Possibly, but it's fun nevertheless. And there's plenty of fast-paced fist-fighting going on in between that distracts you from how stupid this plot is. I mean, you don't go into a McDonald's expecting a sirloin steak dinner, so you shouldn't go into the transporter refueled expecting Mad Max Fury Road. So as long as you do that, you should find this flick to be the definition of a fun, dumb time. And don't you worry, Ed Screen. The Transporter franchise may not have worked out for you, but you've always got the Deadpool franchise. Oh, that's right. You died in that movie. Well, hey, um, maybe they'll have a Crank 3 re-cranked? Unlike the Transporter, I only have one rule. Make sure you get fully drunk by the end of this movie, once you finish playing the awfully good drinking game. Take a shot or drink every time you see the logo of the Russian mobsters, also known as the Quau Brise. The Coeur Brise is hardly a secret, Mr. Karazov. How long have you been working for the Coeur Brise? Hey, you're not fooling me, movie. That's the Bon Jovi logo! So Bon Jovi is made up of Russian mobsters. Slippery when wet, indeed. Someone references the Three Musketeers. All for one, one for all. Like what? You're Count D'Artagnan and they're the Three Musketeers. Uh, wait a minute, that's not the actual Three Musketeers book. That's one of those abridged classic books that they publish for kids. <laughs> Holy shit. These prostitutes are better off watching the goddamn Mickey Mouse movie. Ray Stevenson calls his son, Junior. Did you see the building, Junior? I assume you have a plan, Junior. Don't call me Junior. And take a double shot, not just for the two times someone gets tasered, but when Ray Stevenson calls his son a fobbit. I stay within the lines. Watch everything play out. That's exactly what a fobbit is. What is a fobbit, you ask? Well, Urban Dictionary says it's a soldier who stays in an operating base instead of going on a mission. Well, would a fobbit be able to jump off a jet ski and into the window of a moving car? I don't think so. And on the nudity watch, this PG-13 flick offers no nudity, but plenty of scantily cladness from its gang of prostitute bank robbers who disguise themselves as Lady Gaga and happen to be lesbians. And that, my friends, would have been a better Point Break remake. On the enjoyableness continuum scale from Boulder Bruce, the transporter refueled may be a rusty hunk of junk, but has enough gas to reach a top speed of 7 out of 10. And considering this is the same studio that brought us Kevin Spacey as a talking cat, I want a crossover. I'm Jesse Shea for JoeBlow.com, and no, I'm totally serious. I want that Transporter Nine Lives crossover movie immediately, because I think it'll be just the thing to bring the Transporter franchise back to life. You're gonna make me late, and I hate being late.